What is a paranoid style? Uh, paranoid style is a phrase that was used for the first time by a political scientist, an American political scientist called Richard Hofstadter, in an essay uh, which he wrote in 1964, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. Basically, what he said was the conspiracy theories are defined by the paranoid style. Uh, what is a conspiracy theory? There's a difference between a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory. We shouldn't make the mistake of saying that no conspiracy exists. Conspiracies do exist. They simply consist of a group of people agreeing in secret to take deliberate action against a third party, against someone else, against the interests of someone else. The characteristics are there must be more than one person, otherwise it's not a conspiracy. Agreement between those persons must be secret. If you do things in broad daylight, you're not conspiring. And the th most important one, action must be against <coughs> someone else. If you organize a surprise party for your dad's birthday, that's not a conspiracy because it's not against him. Um, actual conspiracies are very different from the imagined one. For example, the Watergate scandal during the 70s in the US was a real conspiracy, an actual conspiracy. The conspiracy had very specific purposes, which was spying on Nixon's enemies, especially the top leaders of the Democratic Party. There is a limited number of actors. Basically, it was the main collaborators of the president. In fact, uh, the famous investigation by both Woodward and Carl Bernstein uh, on the Water Watergate scandal was called All the President's Men because the, the milieu, the clique, was the President's Men, a limited number of actors. Plans are shakily, imperfectly carried out. Uh, the burglars at the Watergate Hotel were caught in the act. And even in case of ramifications, because if an actual conspiracy may be complicated, but not that complicated because the story remains very easy to sum up. There were some top collaborators of the president, Nixon, who uh, had the mission of spying on the president's enemies. Okay, it's very simple. The conspiracy doesn't last long before it's discovered and exposed. And in fact, that's what happened. Once exposed, the conspiracy is over. The end. Its effects may persist, but operations cease. Okay. The conspiracies which conspiracist theorists talk about are very, very different. I'll take the example of Pizzagate, which is a particularly absurd one. I'll talk about it later on. The alleged conspiracy has the widest, widest imaginable scope, no specific purposes, because it aims at ruling or conquering or destroying the whole world. The conspiracy involves a huge and potentially unlimited number of actors, a number that seems to increase at every account, because anyone who denies the conspiracy is immediately denounced as part <coughs> of it. Okay. So the number keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. Everyone's involved in the conspiracy. Uh, third characteristic, it's carried out in an extremely coherent ultra-consistent way, everything goes exactly as planned. But the story is so complicated, convoluted, and cumbersome, it's impossible to sum a map. Look at that map. Impossible. Okay. Fourth characteristic, the conspiracy is described as having been going on for years, decades, some of them even centuries. And the last one, which is, I think is the most important, the alleged conspiracy still goes on and on and on in spite of tons of literature, tons of books exposing it. It's a paradox. There are thousands of books devoted to debunking conspiracy theories, but those conspiracy theories are described as ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. So it's very different from what happened with Watergate. Once exposed, it was over. It keeps being exposed. But it keeps going on because it doesn't exist, of course. OK, let me talk about what we did about conspiracy in practical terms in Italy during the 90s. 
because before the Wu Ming Foundation, of which I am a member, there was the Luther Brissett Project. Luther Brissett was an open uh, nickname, an open moniker, uh, a multi-use name that everybody could adopt. Uh, hundreds of activists, artists, uh, cultural agitators in the second half of the 90s in Italy and other countries adopted the name Luther Brissett. Everybody was Luther Brissett in order to pull extremely complicated media pranks. Basically, uh, it was about uh, creating a, a narrative that was completely made up of fake news, uh, a complex web of fake news, and then pass all these fake news onto the media, and then claim responsibility for, for them, okay? And explain what was the mechanism that we had exploited, exploited in order to get those stories in the press, in the media. The purpose was not spread fake news per se. It was to create and expand a narrative, a communitarian narrative that would stimulate collective imagination and cooperation. I'll mention LARPs very often in this presentation. LARPs are live action role-playing games, maybe some of you know about them. Okay, that, that was the, the point. The, the key factor of the narrative was the collective name Luther Bissett itself, which we borrowed from a British soccer player, that one. He played an extremely bad season in AC Milan in 1993-84. Uh, he went back to the UK. Ten years later, anonymous cultural guerrillas started to use his name. He was baffled at the beginning. He said, why do these people use my name? But then he understood and he even uh, claimed he was part of the project himself. He gave interviews about us, about our work, saying that he was uh, flattered. He was very happy about what we were doing. Uh, so as I said, hundreds of people used uh, the Luther Bresson name as a signature in order to build uh, action after action, prank after prank, writing after writing, performance after performance, uh, performance, the open reputation of an imaginary bandit like a Robin Hood of the digital age, a media prankster, an imaginary media prankster. If, if you're interested, the best, so far the best account of the uh, Luther Brissett project in English uh, is featured in this book called Improper Names, Collective Pseudonyms from the Luddites to Anonymous. Uh, written by Marco De Seris, uh, and it was published by the Minnesota University Press two years ago. Anyway, I say it's not about fake news, because our media pranks had precise aims. I'll, I'll make some example in a while. Uh, the, content, the content was not chosen at random. Our pranks were always played, they were pulled in order to raise awareness on some sensitive issues, and the way the media talked about them. The tactic, uh, pranks had an educational DIY aspect. We always explained what we had done, always. We did what we called the reverse engineering ourselves. Uh, we always revealed that they were pranks. It, it wasn't about you know, swindling people, making people believe in something that wasn't true. It was about shaking the willingness of people to believe anything and then explain what we had done. So we explained in detail what kind of cultural automatisms and bugs in the information system we had exploited in order to get those false stories in the press. So the account of how we had played the prank was more important than the prank itself. And community, because each prank added to the mythical, legendary reputation of Luther Blissett as a social bandit, as a Robin Hood, as a cultural prankster, and made people very proud of adopting the name. I'm part of the Luther Blissett project. I am Luther Blissett too. So it was ever more interesting, more and more effectively appealing to be Luther Blissett, because you felt being part of a community. You shared a style, a certain imagery, even if you never met, you never physically met the other members of the network. That was very important. Okay, so what were the, 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 uh, the themes, the issues, you know, uh, the content of our pranks? 
For example, uh, what we did from 1996 to 1998 was pulling elaborate media pranks to demonstrate how dangerous the great pedophilia, satanic abuse scare uh, that took uh, Italy and Europe uh, by the mid-90s, how dangerous it was. Uh, because there were people who were accused of horrible crimes and they were innocent because there was hysteria in the air. Pranks were parts of uh, inquiries, uh, counter-investigations, solidarity cam campaigns to show that uh, uh, some people accused of uh, satanic ritual abuse were innocent. That guy is called Marco Dimitri. He spent a year and a half uh, in solitary confinement uh, in Bologna prison with uh, heinous uh, accusations, with no charges, and then he was completely acquitted also thanks to our solidarity campaign and our pranks. Uh, the most complex prank that we played was played by dozens and dozens of people in central Italy, in the backwoods around Viterbo, which is a, a town north of Rome. Um, the prank uh, was very complex. It lasted a whole year, involving Satanism, black masses, uh, Christian anti-Satanist anti vigilantes, and so on. It was all made up. None of these people really existed. There were neither Satanists nor vigilantes. There were only fake pictures, uh, strategically spread rumors, and crazy press releases. Um, but the local and national media bought everything. They believed in everything with no fact-checking at all. Dozens of articles, uh, headlines, uh, uh, moral panic, uh, and then uh, mass paranoia. Uh, there were satanists everywhere. Uh, we even managed to get footage of a rather clumsy satanic ritual abuse in the national TV news. It was all, all false, okay? And then we claimed the responsibility for the whole thing and produced a huge mass of evidence explaining that we were responsible for that, that nothing was real. And it, was, uh, it caused quite a sensation because uh, it, it took place uh, uh, at the same time of uh, that huge uh, grassroots counter-inquiry on cases of, of full child abuse allegations I was talking about. No? So there, there was a, th this big prank going on, this video prank going on, and this big counter-investigation going on at the same time, and, the, and they complemented each other. We also brought a book about all this, um, and a magistrate whom we targeted in the book filed a lawsuit, uh, and as a consequence the book was impounded and disappeared from bookshops, but not from the web. It's still there. So, secret tunnels, dungeons, ubiquitous child sex rings, satanic ritual abuse, that kind of stuff. All these conspiracy theories are not new. They are part uh, of the Western uh, cultural imagery and imaginations since the Middle Ages at least. Their key elements can be traced back to ancient anti-Semitic myths. For example, the one, the most famous one, knows, uh, known as the blood libel, which was about uh, uh, Jews kidnapping and killing the children of Christian in order to use their blood for cooking pastry uh, that was to be eaten during Easter and Passover. That was an old hate legend that kept circulating in Europe uh, for centuries and uh, periodically resurfaced. And these conspiracy theories about pedophilia and child abuse, not real pedophilia, not real child abuse, but satanic, you know, uh, keep in mind the difference between actual conspiracies and conspiracism. Okay, so there, there really is child abuse, of course, it, it really exists, and there's pedophilia really exists, but these kind of conspiracy theories about satanic child abuse and uh, uh, hidden dungeons with uh, uh, um, child sex rings and, and all that kind of stuff is a completely different thing. As we will see, these images of dungeons, of haunted uh, houses uh, where child abuse uh, takes place with the complicity of key politicians and state officials and that kind of stuff, resurfaced once again in US culture two years ago during the 2016 presidential campaign and keeps resurfacing. Um, why did I uh, mention LARPs? 
live action role playing games because, as I said, uh, our pranks were, uh, were orchestrated, organized, and pooled with the cooperation of many, many, many people. There was a whole network of people collaborating, cooperating in order to pull those pranks. Uh, this map uh, is related to one of our early pranks. Um, we uh, faked uh, the disappearance, the, not only the disappearance, but the whole life and career of a, a British artist called Harry Kipper, who disappeared uh, in northern Italy while trying to write uh, the word art on the map of uh, the continent, uh, touring with a mountain bike. Uh, he disappeared uh, basically here. Okay. Uh, we invented his face by morphing uh, for uh, 1930s photographs of uh, uh, three uh, great, great uncles of mine and uh, one great, great aunt. Okay. Uh, and the, this was the result. He said, missing, who saw him? The, uh, we plastered the walls of several Italian cities with this poster, and uh, newspapers uh, uh, published uh, the news about uh, this guy who had disappeared. We invented uh, the names of uh, his uh, uh, works of art, uh, uh, his whole biography, and uh, even national television, uh, Italian state television, uh, started to look for him, so several members of the Luther Blister Project posed as uh, friends of his, members of the Luther Blister Project who lived in London, who were, were Londoners, uh, even uh, took uh, the Italian TV crew around town saying, yeah, he used to live here, nothing, nothing real, no fact checking at all. Okay, that was the first one. The other one was another in 1999, we uh, repeated the thing, but it was much more complicated because we faked the, the death of a uh, Serbian artist called Darko Maver, who had never existed. But we fooled uh, even some important art critics who, who wrote, of course, I know him, yeah, he's very famous, but, but he, he, he never existed. Okay, we invented his uh, sculpt, sculptures. Uh, stuff. So it was a matter of Role, uh, uh, live action role playing and alternate reality games, which is another concept uh, that's typical of game culture. This was a, a friend of ours who posed as the dead artist, and this photo was published by several newspapers and art reviews. Okay, so it isn't about fake news, it's about magic. This guy is called Mariano Tomatis, he's a magician and a historian of illusionism, who is now part of the Wuming Foundation. He's a a uh, key collaborator of, of Wu Ming, he explores ways of uh, revealing the trick behind the magic number, the magic act, which, <coughs> apart from spoiling the show, make it even more magic. You know, usually magicians, illusionists, mentalists, uh, never want you to know the trick they use, of course, because they, they, they say it will spoil the show. Okay, it will ruin, <coughs> it will ruin everything. Okay, but uh, there are ways of making the magic act even more interesting by revealing the trick and even more magic. That's what we did even before knowing and collaborating with Tomatis. That's what we did at the times of the Luther Visa project because our media pranks were magic acts that benefited from their own explanation, from their own reverse engineering. It became even more magical. No? Because it's not about fake news. Sometimes some people, uh, recalling what we did, uh, say that uh, what we did was spreading fake news. It wasn't about that. Absolutely. It would have been much more easy to spread fake news, even back then. Now it's easier than, than it ever was because of the internet, of social media, etc. But what we wanted to know was completely different. It was a matter of political activism and education and making people more aware which is the contrary of what they've used the world. So today, it's very, very easy to create and spread fake news. What's more and more difficult, difficult than, it, than, than 20 years ago, is to keep this balance. I'm talking about this educational aspect, the sense of communal purpose. OK, so here's an example of uh, how a magic trick um, a, a magic act can benefit from the explanation of the trick. These people 
Penn and Teller, for probably the best magicians in the world. And this is an act, very, very short, but uh, I think it's very useful to see it, called Lift Off of Love. This, uh, this is an example of what I wanted to explain. OK, so come to the novel Q. The novel Q. During the Luther Bishop project, uh, uh, at a certain point, some of us had the idea of writing a novel writing a novel that would be also an allegorical uh, interpretation, allegorical you know, narrative of the Luther Bissett project itself. It was one of the levels of interpretation of the novel, no? a historical novel. During uh, a meeting with about 50 people, uh, one of these uh, members of the Luther Bissett project said, I think uh, we are we're experimenting with many media, you know, many forms of communication, but we haven't yet written a novel. What about that? Who's willing to cooperate with me in writing a novel? And four people uh, raised their hands, and those became the authors of Q, and I'm one of them. OK, there were 50 people in the room, but four raised their hands because they were interested in writing a novel, and we did it. We did it. OK, it took three years to write it. Uh, and it was published in March 1999 in Italy, and then it was translated in 18 languages. It was published in 30 countries, and, and our career as novelists started Thanks to that, okay, okay. Q, Q is a novel about uh, uh, the 16th uh, century radical uprisings that followed Martin Luther's Reformation. Reformation was wasn't only a, a, a religious thing, a matter of faith, uh, of theology. It was also a social, a social phenomenon, uh, and uh, there were very radical interpretations of the Reformation. One of the Leaders of those uprisings uh, was Thomas Munzer. He led uh, the so-called Peasants' War, which was the very first attempt of a modern revolution. It lasted uh, two years. Uh, there was a, a peasant army, uh, an, an insurgent army of peasants. They burned the castles. Uh, they confiscated uh, uh, the, the wealth of the, of the princes and nobles and, uh, and, and uh, bishops uh, until uh, they were repressed. Uh, they lost uh, a key field battle in uh, Frankenhausen. They were practically exterminated, but it was... Uh, always interpreted as the very first revolution, modern revolution in a contemporary sense. Uh, Q is, um, is set uh, in, in that story on, in, on the, that backdrop. Uh, there's a, a militant uh, radical heretic, an Anabaptist, with many names. We never get to know his real name because he changes his name basically. In every chapter he changes identity because he moves from riot to riot, from insurrection to insurrection. Uh, from uh, revolutionary plot to revolutionary plot. And he's uh, the villain, I mean, his enemy is an anonymous <coughs> Vatican agent, agent provocateur, agent provocateur, a spy, but not only a spy, because his role is uh, more complex than that, because he infiltrates the radical movements of the era, he spreads misleading information. Uh, that's why the, in our novel, the peasants choose to go to Frankenhausen to fight a field battle. They, they have a false information, uh, and they believe that false information, they, and they fall in the trap, okay? And uh, these misleading information, uh, these fake news, okay, uh, are uh, vehiculated, conveyed uh, through letters that are signed Kohelet, okay, which is a, a book of the Bible. Uh, it means preacher in Hebrew. Uh, and also, this guy constantly reports he sends accounts of his own activity to his boss, who is Cardinal uh, Gian Pietro Carafa in Rome. He, he became Pope uh, Paul IV uh, a few years later. And his dispatches are signed simply Q. When uh, Q was published in Italy for the first time, almost 20 years ago, there was a rumor that briefly circulated that uh, Luther, uh, the man, the mastermind behind the Luther Brissett collective moniker was not none other than Umberto Eco. Because our book uh, talked about heretics, and the name of the rose talked about heretics. They immediately, OK, heretics here must be Umberto Eco. Um, but the two novels are completely different from each other uh, in all aspects. Anyway, the rumor circulated, it, then it was debunked. But this kind of four parallel uh, stuck 
uh, it resurfaces periodically. People say, Ma, uh, weren't you influenced by Umberto Eco? Wasn't Umberto Eco involved in that thing? No, absolutely not. Anyway, why did I mention Eco? Because his ghost uh, is haunting the debate. Uh, his figure is very important. Anyway, okay, this is just uh, important to, it is important to know that you uh, was a, a bestseller in Italy and it was published uh, in uh, several countries. Uh, in the, uh, on this side of the Atlantic, it isn't very well known. It's much more famous as a novel in, in Europe. Uh, it got some kind of influence, okay, and we'll see that. Okay, after Q, we became Wu Ming, the four authors of. Uh, of uh, Q became the Wu Ming collective, and and then something happened. We're addicted to creating networks. We're completely addicted to that. Uh, we can't help but doing it. So Wu Ming is a name adopted in January 2000 by us, by the <laughs> authors who, using the collective name Luther Brissett, wrote the novel Q. After the end of the Luther Brissett project and the global impact of Q. We decided to keep experimenting with the novel form and with historical fiction. So in the following years, we, followed, we wrote uh, many more books, uh, 54, Manituana, Altai, uh, The Army of Sleepwalkers. And in this day, we just finished a new novel titled Prodecult. You see the hammer and sickle there. It's a, it's a spaceship with the shape of a hammer and sickle because it's a science fiction novel. Uh, we also wrote uh, non-fiction, uh, a, a very hybrid kind, heavily researched, fact-filled stuff, uh, which one might simplistically describe as creative non-fiction. We call them unidentified narrative objects, UNOs. Then, in Italy, a sort of fan activism has developed around our books, and uh, a vast community developed out of our blog, uh, it's called JAP, and our Twitter profile with uh, lots of experiments in transmedia storytelling and collaborative projects, open workshops, uh, seminars, uh, new blogs, uh, uh, further collectives uh, collaborating with us, uh, even new mountaineering clubs. You see this, Alpinismo Molotov is the name of a mount radical mountaineering club that was born out of our blog. Uh, this process had already started um, in the how do you call them? The notes, the double zeros, the previous, de okay, last decade. Uh, there are many ways to, to call them, uh, no, not a standard one. So, uh, some say the notes, some say the double zeros, uh, the 2000s, uh, and, anyway. Uh, but this process intensified and accelerated during the 2010s, the, the, the current decade. Uh, and this collective or collective is what we call the Wu Ming Foundation. It was in these guys that we intervened in the QAnon debate, which I'm going to talk about now. This is a creepy but interesting thing that started in October 2017. But before talking about QAnon, I have to talk about Pizzagate. OK, Pizzagate is one of the most absurd conspiracy theories ever. It's about human <coughs> trafficking, human trafficking and pedophile rings. Uh, According to these conspiracy theorists, top members of the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton's uh, presidential campaign aides allegedly uh, have been committing child abuse in the basement of Comet Ping Pong, which is a Washington DC pizzeria that doesn't have a basement. The story became ever more convoluted and uh, such conspiracy theorists uh, in famous conspiracy theorists as Alex Jones or Mike Cernovich kept fueling suspicions about that pizzeria until on December 4, 2016, a man entered Comet Ping Pong with a rifle and opened fire. Uh, luckily, there were no victims. Uh, after that, it seemed that the Pizzagate theory had gone out of fashion among the conspiracists, but it was an illusion because actually it was evolving into the next conspiracy theory, which is QAnon. QAnon started in uh, October 2017, when uh, on the 4chan image board, one of those forums, uh, internet forums, on which you can do basically everything with no restraints, started uh, uh, some uh, 
posts signed by a signed Q started to be published by an anonymous source, allegedly writing from the top levels of the government machine, US government machine, very cryptic messages, which came to be referred to as breadcrumbs, messages that don't appear to make any sense at all or are open to any interpretation. Some examples is future proves past. Learn to read the map. Godfather 3. And acronyms and numbers. DNC SR 187 MS 13 DWS. And people go, wow, what, what does it mean? Okay. And also uh, the frequent use of number 17, which appears everywhere 17, 17, 17. Uh, some say it's because uh, uh, Q is the 17th uh, letter of the English alphabet. Users that became uh, Q and non believers call themselves bakers because they make all these breadcrumbs into dough. They interpret the clues, extrapolate predictions, and elaborate on the allegedly underlying theory, which is called the storm. It's called the storm because the storm is a reference to a casual statement uh, Donald Trump made on October 6 while posing for a photograph with a senior military staff. He told reporters without any explanation, could be the calm before the storm. What do you mean? He didn't explain. What is the theory? What is the theory? The theory is incredible. The theory is that there's a cabal that uh, has been running the US government and the whole planet for decades for the purpose of having a child sex ring in the background. They're all pedophiles. Obama, the Clintons, and even Tom Hanks, they're all pedophiles. They're part of the cabal. Trump was appointed by the military to save the US and the world from this horror. Q, this guy, or this group of guys calling themselves Q, Q claims that Trump is not really under investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller, as everyone thinks. No, because there's an investigation on Trump going on. They say that Clinton and Obama are under investigation, and Mueller is actually working for Trump. So it's the opposite of what appears. Okay. They say that uh, the Justice Department, the US Justice Department, has filed at least 25,000 sealed secret indictments against Democratic leaders, Hollywood celebrities, these conspiracy theorists obsessed with Hollywood celebrities, and wealthy elites. OK, there are thousands of sealed uh, documents uh, in the files of the Justice Department, but uh, many uh, of the, most of them are not <coughs> indictments. So it's completely false. But anyway, the moment uh, when uh, this operation, this Trump-led operation, will take down, will take down the evil cabal uh, and the, the pedophile sex rings uh, by making public all the responsibilities. And uh, it, it's called the Great Awakening. OK. Following that, o uh, Obama, the Clintons, Tom Hanks, and many other key figures and public figures will be sent to the Guantanamo Bay Special Prison. When uh, uh, a few weeks ago John McCain died, the QAnon community said that he didn't really die of uh, a cancer as everyone thinks. He committed suicide because he knew he would be arrested during the Great Awakening, because, of course, he was part of the cabal himself. So not only Democrats, also Republicans that are not Trumpists are part of the conspiracy. Q's mission is to prepare the public for the great day. And there was a, a crescendo, as we say, no? In the first half of 2018, the QAnon community moved from 4chan and 8chan, okay, kind of image boards and sites where you can do everything everything you want without no moderation. They moved from, from there to Reddit, YouTube, and Twitter. They colonized vast areas of those social media uh, to the extent that in April 2018, the QAnon app called QDrops was launched 
and made the top seller list in Apple's App, App Store and Google's Play Store. It was uh, downloaded and installed by millions of people. Uh, in the meantime, a lot of merchandise uh, was being produced, uh, QAnon t-shirts, QAnon coffee mugs, QAnon hats, and so on. Uh, QAnon became very popular among right-wing boomers, people over 40. Some celebrities publicly endorsed the conspiracy theory. The most famous one was the actress Roseanne Barr. Okay? She tweeted about QAnon saying that she believes it, that uh, Donald Trump is a hero is fighting against pedophiles. On uh, April 7th, uh, uh, 2018, there was a QAnon march in Washington, D.C., attended by less than 200 people, probably even less, but it was the first appearance of QAnon in the real world, which means outside internet forums. At, the, uh, at a certain point, we heard about QAnon, and of course there are many parallels between our novel, the plot of our novel, and our activities as Luther Brisson. Because you see, the issues are the same. Uh, satanic ritual abuse, pedophilia. Okay, So we, we started to use Twitter in order to see some doubts about the origins of the conspiracy theory. Isn't it a prank inspired by the Luther Brisson project and our novel Q? Q? Okay, maybe it started as a prank from people who used fortune in order to troll the alt-right, that kind of milieu, you know. Because there are many striking parallels between our work, our novel, and this conspiracy theory. So we started to use Twitter. And uh, we find ourselves... Uh, we found ourselves in a, in a storm, <laughs> yeah, in a substorm, because many journalists from several countries, from the US, from France, from Germany, started to call us, to get in touch with us, asking for interviews about QAnon. Um, is QAnon a LARP, an alternate reality game, so a live action role playing? Yeah, in a way. A conspiracy theory, a simple conspiracy theory, it's, it's uh, merely a conspiracy theory. It's, as, as Morgan Little wrote, it's more an environment that welcomes conspiratorial thinking. It became much more than a single conspiracy theory. It's a participatory conspiracy theory. As Margaret Peacock, Peacock is an expert in conspiracy, and she wrote that. No, she, she gave an interview on Snopes saying participatory conspiracy theories lay out a scenario or situation and then they ask their audience, what more can you find out about this? What more can you add? It turns the audience into willing participants. And in fact, you have the breadcrumbs that don't mean a thing, okay, because they're too cryptic to have any meaning. And you have the bakers that interpret the breadcrumbs and extrapolate the predictions. You know, John McCain uh, was about to be arrested. Uh, they committed suicide. That, that's a, a participatory project in which many people take these uh, uh, mysterious references and turn them into part of a narrative. Is it ironic? That's a key question. Yes and no. Of course, some of the people who are in the QAnon community <coughs> are being ironic, okay, because you know, the alt-right culture, 4chan culture is a uh, uh, trolling culture, you know. More, many people don't believe, don't actually believe what they write. They want to be provocative, they want to be offensive, uh, but there are many other people who really believe what Q says and what the QAnon community says about this, the storm, the great awakening, this kind of stuff. So, uh, there, there's uh, some people pulling a prank in a way that some other are good people that really believe what Q says. But how can they believe that? Okay, How can they believe such bullshit? There's another way to put it. Because uh, it, uh, there's a, a, another strange element. Usually, conspiracy theories are opposition theories against those that are in power. In this case, Donald Trump is the president. He is in power. He took over 
but and his fans, his supporters, <coughs> are com completely into a conspiracy theory. They're in power. I mean, they won the election. Their guy is at the White House. This is strange because usually conspiracy theories are uh, carried out by the opposition. In this case, it's the government. I mean, people who voted for this guy managed to put this guy into the White House. But so why are they indulging in such incredible conspiracy theories? Uh, because it's a case of cognitive dissonance. You know, they have to cope with cognitive dissonance about Donald Trump as they imagine him and what Donald Trump is actually doing. Most people thought that uh, Donald Trump would be a hero for the white working class and stuff like that, etc. They have a lot of utopian expectations about his victory. And of course, nothing happened. So they have to kind of compensate the gap between the dream and the reality. So they created a sort of wild fantasy about their leader being a secret genius. You think he isn't doing anything, but in secret he's got a master plan. He's fighting against evil forces that uh, run the world. He's playing a multi-dimensional chess game. That's what, that's what they say usually. No. So they have to make Donald Trump look uh, different from the actual one. Uh, as Michel Goldberg put it on the New York Times, you don't need an occult story about how your side is secretly winning if it's actually winning. If you need to say that it's secretly winning, it means that it doesn't look like it's winning at all. Okay, uh, so that's a thing. You have a conspiracy theory in which the heroes are in charge, which is very rare. Usually the heroes of a conspiracy theory are the underdogs, the opposition. Okay, what happened then? I called it QAnon's wild foray into real life because the situation started to become very dangerous. Um, in June, in June 2018, a man armed with an AR-15 rifle drove a truck, an armored truck, onto the Hoover Dam Bridge in Nevada. And uh, he confronted the police for hours uh, before they managed to arrest him. While he was blocking the traffic, he held up a sign that read, release the OIG report. This is part of the QAnon narrative. The QAnon community believes that the Inspector General's report on the Clinton email leak investigation of last year uh, which was released, this report was released, uh, released on June 24, they think that it's fake, it's not the real report. Trump has the real report in a drawer. If uh, Trump released the real Inspector General report, it would bring down his enemies because the second report supposedly proves that the FBI, the Justice Department, and top Democratic leaders broke laws in an attempt to stop Trump from winning the presidency. So they think there's another OIG report, and this guy wanted Trump to release it. Another, another example of QAnon wild, QAnon's wild foray in real life is this. Uh, QAnon-inspired militias of far-rightists started to look for child sex camps in Arizona. They spent the summer last summer looking for clues on these alleged child sex camps along the Interstate 19 in Arizona. They tried to convince the Tucson police that an abandoned homeless camp showed clear signs of child slavery activity. Of course, the police inspected the place and found nothing significant. Another, another example is this. This is probably the most uh, serious one. On August 10th, a man was arrested in Orange County, South California, for allegedly setting the devastating arson called the Holy Fire. This guy is a QAnon believer. 
He posted a lot of QAnon stuff on Twitter and probably he set this fire uh, in the context of uh, his personal war against the child sex ring cabal of which Q talks about. Okay, then what happened next? It happened that on July 31st, a cheering crowd wearing QAnon t shirts and showing QAnon signs stole the scene at a Trump rally in Tampa, Florida. That was QAnon's definitive coming out. It became big news nationwide and in a matter of few days, worldwide. Okay, even the Italian media talked about that. On 8 Chan, Q commented, Welcome to the mainstream. We knew this day would come. Then Trump started to play with QAnon references himself. Uh, he received uh, this guy at the White House in the Oval Office uh, a few weeks ago. He, this guy is one of QAnon's biggest promoters. He's a radio host and YouTuber. He's called Lionel LeBron, and he is posing for a photo with President Trump. And of course, Trump knows who this guy is. Okay, so he's playing with QAnon himself. He's the most irresponsible president of all times. Um, why did the Q write, welcome to the mainstream, we knew this day would come? Because the QAnon community was enthusiastic about mainstream media coverage of uh, the Tampa event. Therefore, at last, uh, we are in the mainstream media. They're talking about us. So, uh, ineffective ways of covering uh, conspiracy theories. There's a way of covering them which fuels them, okay? Uh, gives them more power of fascination, okay? And it's a vicious circle. These are two quotes that I think are very, very important. No? So Whitney Phillips on The Guardian wrote, many journalistic responses to trollish media manipulation tactics have remained constant. What this coverage has always done is incentivize precisely the behaviors it purports to condemn. In the process, it ensures that the same tactics will be used in the future because the tactics are proven to work. Okay, it worked with Pizzagate and it worked with QAnon. And the other QAnon related phenomena are vastly magnified by the media. Over the past few years, after all, we've learned a lot about how internet communities can manipulate public attention and the media to make themselves appear larger and more powerful than they are. It's a prank. It's all, it's prankish. I mean, it or, or it's trollish, at least, because there's conscious manipulation of the media on part of the QAnon community. It's uh, an evil version of what we used to do in the 90s, okay? With no explanation, with no reverse engineering. The difference is that we always claim the responsibility and reveal that we're responsible for our false news, our pranks, our provocations, okay? And explain what bugs we had exploded. There's no explanation here. It keeps going on and on and on. Popping the balloon is counterproductive. Okay, in Italian we use this word guasta feste. It be, literally means party spoilers. Guastare means to spoil and fest and party. Okay. In English there's the word kill joy. Okay, guasta feste means kill joy. Um, the skeptics and uh, the bankers and mainstream com commenters you know, who pop the balloons of conspiracy theories or pseudo-medicine pseudo or paranormal activities or kind of swindles end up playing the role of the killjoy, of the Guasta Fest. If you pop a conspiracy balloon in the name of the establishment, of the mainstream, relying on any sort of authority, be it a political authority or journalistic authority or academic authority, you end up strengthening the desire for alternative views, because conspiracy theories are allegedly against the power, if you debunk them from a position of power, you play exactly the game. And in fact, uh, uh, there's a lot of debunking around of articles, thousands of articles explaining that conspiracy theories are bullshit, but conspiracy theories thrive and keep thriving all over the world. So that's something that doesn't work here. Okay. Believing in a conspiracy makes you feel like you're against the powers that be, against authorities, against capitalism, against official truths. And at the same time, 
believing in conspiracy theories provides you with a game-like experience, as we saw. It's fun, okay? Being a conspiracy theorist, being a QAnon baker is fun. You have intriguing and sometimes marvelous things to entertain you with. The banking doesn't take this into account. Think, no, it's just mad, it's just mad. No, it's not, it, it's not that easy. Conspiracy theorists are in the same league are as psychics, magicians, not illusionists, people who really claim they have magic powers, astrologists and gurus of pseudo-medicine. All these people work in the field of wonder, the field of surprising alternative views, the field of fascination. In doing this, they exploit basic human needs because in our life, we do need surprise. We do need to wonder. We do need new angles from which looking at things and thinking we're different from anybody else. Uh, conspiracy theories provide all that. They say, this is the truth. You know about it and other people don't. Other people don't. You, you've been red-pilled. They use this metaphor from the Matrix movie. No. People who know about the truth, who know about those hidden uh, child sex rings, about the cabal, about the storm, they say, I took the red pill. Because, because the Neo, the main character in the Matrix, as I said, takes the red pill and he sees the Matrix reality. He, 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 he was living in an illusion. Okay. Okay. So, like, you took the red pill, you're special. You're not like everybody else, you know. Conspiracy theories, the theorists provide these to people and channel the people's anxiety about their lives into the belief in an all-explaining narrative. So, we all agree that those balloons must be taken down, but you don't have to pop them like a poop, like that. Okay, because it doesn't solve any problems. It doesn't solve any problems. It doesn't address those needs I was talking about. And another important thing, very important thing, it doesn't will deal with the kernel of truth that's hidden inside every conspiracy theory. Because every conspiracy theory forms around the kernel of truth. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Okay. For example, the chemtrails conspiracy theory has a kernel of truth. You know, many. Conspiracy theories in indirectly express anxiety about climate change and the inaction, the inadequacy of governments and international institutions. Information on what's going on uh, is certainly not, uh, not lacking. Every time there's a disaster, a hurricane, a huge fire like the Holy Fire, a calamitous drought, the media speak of global warming as the main cause, after which nobody seems to be anything relevant to stop climate change. This generates in all of us uh, a sort of, yeah, yet another cognitive dissonance because we think, how is it possible that the situation, the situation is so bad if those who are at the upper reaches of power, the politicians, uh, tycoons, those who would have the means, the money and the influence to deal with the problem, don't seem to worry about it at all. Cognitive dissonance, you have to cope with the gap between what the media say about, about climate change and the line of conduct, the, the, the fact that politicians are doing anything. Okay, so since the system cannot deny itself and must constantly divert the currents of culture in the direction of its homeostasis, its stabilization, the system cannot deny itself. So anxiety about climate change gives way to diversionary narratives like the chemtrails conspiracy theory. There's no conspiracy behind uh, this process. Nobody decides that you don't have to talk about climate change, you have to talk about chemtrails. Nobody decides that because these narratives generate themselves. It is largely a matter of cultural autom automatisms. So in a, in a later stage, of their development, of the development of this theory, there are all sorts of charlatans, demagogues, and wannabe gurus will encourage, refine, and exploit this narrative. But at the beginning, they are a spontaneous product of the collective imagination. So the delusions about the alleged composition of chemtrails and the 
global plot to poison us all, because that's what they say. They poison in us all. They deliberately poison in us because those chemtrails are made of toxic uh, poisons that are intentionally put into the atmosphere in order to make us more stupid or kill us or something like that. These are distorted interpretations of a real phenomenon. Even the symptom is correctly identified because the exponential increase in air traffic, thanks to low cost flights, uh, has increased the pollution of the atmosphere and it does have consequences on weather and climate. So it's real. The problem is the raving diversion from the kernel of truth, which prevents everybody from correctly posing this problem. So you have a lot of talk about the chemtrails and not about the real problem. Okay. Another example, it's all the conspiracy theories centered around this guy, George Soros. Okay, this is, uh, people are completely obsessed with this guy. They see him everywhere. Okay. Uh, this is also, in a way, related to climate change, because climate change is also one of the main causes of uh, uh, the new mass migrations from uh, Africa, from the Middle East, from Asia, and possibly in the near future from Southern Europe as well, because droughts and extreme heat uh, make uh, parts of the planet less and less habitable, of course. Uh, they tear away the social fabric, they uh, provoke wars for living space, for water, and other necessary resources. So people move, they emigrate, okay. They leave Africa, they leave the Middle East. Uh, but how often do we hear about climate change in everyday talk on immigration? Very rarely, in Europe, almost never. In this case too, especially in Europe, a diversionary narrative, a conspiracy theory developed. It's the so-called substitution of nations. It's an alleged plan to have Europe and the West colonized by Muslims and blacks and other undesirables. And who is the puppeteer of this plan? Obviously, George Soros, that is the Jew, the ruthless evil man, uh, the old elder of Zion who plots in the shadows. Uh, there are ancient prejudices reappearing here. And even in this case, there is a kernel of truth because Soros is indeed a tycoon who with certain reckless financial speculations, has undermined national economies. Uh, he did a lot of damage to Italian economy in the early 90s, for example. But to see him everywhere is typical of the paranoid style. Uh, to say that he plans world migrations is absurd, of course. Nobody can do that. And usually, those who see Soros everywhere have nothing against other billionaires whose activities and incursions into politics have had much more impact from the Koch brothers to Donald Trump himself. Last one, 9-11 truthers uh, stating that the US government staged 9-11 and blew up uh, the Twin Towers uh, is uh, a manifestation of the paranoid style, of course. But there's a kernel of truth. Many. Serious historians doubt that the Gulf of Tonkin torpedo attack, which the US exploited in order to start the Vietnam War, uh, ever took place. And uh, it is also a fact that in 2003, uh, General Colin Powell presented the UN Security Council with fabricated evidence on Saddam Hussein's alleged, alleged weapons of mass destruction. This was an actual conspiracy. And as happens with actual conspiracy, it was debunked and exposed in a reasonably short time, Saddam Hussein did not have those weapons of mass destruction. But it was debunked too late because the, the war had already taken place. Okay. But in a reasonably short time, in less than a year, it was completely debunked. Okay. So the US government lied very often about its enemy's actions. And sometimes the US literally attacked themselves in order to create a Casper war, like uh, with the Vietnam War. If you debunk the absurd theories on 9-11 without exposing their kernel of truth, you're not credible. Okay, because they say, oh, because you, you are an agent of imperialism, you know. Uh, you end up strengthening the belief in that conspiracy theory. What do we have to do? Parody? Okay, sometimes people say we have to strike conspiracies with satire with parody, you know, we show that they are so ridiculous, you know, it doesn't work. 
very well. Uh, satire doesn't work well against con conspiracism. Uh, very often, satire fits the same vicious circle as any other kind of coverage. Um, every intent and critical aspect of parody evaporates in a very short time uh, because for a conspiracist mentality, there is no excessive interpretation. Everything is believable. Okay. You can't do a parody of Pizzagate, okay, because it's so excessive in itself. How can you satirize something like that? Okay. In plain words, uh, there is almost nothing that cannot be believed. Many people <laughs> believe the idiocies scattered by QAnon, which may have been started as a prank or a satire, and will believe even worse idiocies. And they will believe even worse idiocies. Um, crafting conspiracy theories for the sake of satire has a long tradition. In the 1960s, discordianism was crafted as a parody of right-wing occultistic conspiracy theories, the kind of conspiracy theories that were spread by a far-right group called the John Birch Society in the US with the Illuminati cabal uh, you know, controlling everything. Discordianism was a fake conspiracy theory, a satirical one, okay? And uh, in, um, in the 70s, Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Chi drew on discordianism in order to write their Illuminatus trilogy, which was a satire of conspiracy theories. Umberto Eco did something very different with his book Foucault's Pendulum, which is a masterpiece of well, well, the late 20th century literature, Italian literature. It was published in 1988. Uh, uh, We're in the 30th, 30th anniversary of this first publication. <coughs> he explored the impossibility of an effectively critical parody of conspiracies. Uh, his book was frequently compared to the Illuminatus trilogy, but the two approaches couldn't be more different because what Echo says is that parody is impossible. Okay, um, because there's also the fact that a conspiracy theory is already a parody, however unintentional. Um, conspiracyism provides a parodistic description of how capitalism works. The structure and the fundament fundamental logics of the system, which are impersonal logics, are interpreted as personal ones. They are hyper-subjectivized, you know, they're replaced by deliberate action on part of a clique of villains. You know, everything is decided, everything is intentional. You know, there is a plan to culturally destroy the European people, you know, stuff like that. Foucault's <laughs> Pendulum is not a parody of conspiracism. It's an apologue on the pointlessness and even counterproductiveness of doing such a parody. Uh, the, the plot uh, is uh, easily summarized, even if the book is very complex. These three people are employees in a uh, Milan-based publishing house called Garamond. They're called Jacopo Belbo, uh, Casobon, uh, Diotalevi. And there's a fourth character, their personal computer, is called Abulafia. They are frustrated uh, because they keep receiving dozens and dozens and dozens of pro book proposals about conspiracy theories, occultism, the Templars, that kind of stuff. In reaction to that, they start to uh, play a game which consists in putting all existing conspiracy theories together in order to build the narrative of a mega meta conspiracy theory uh, linking e everything, okay, uh, encompassing everything, explaining everything. Of course, it's a game that they play uh, for the sake of parody, for the sake of satire, but in the end, they eerily start to believe their own fabrication and they also are involved in a plot because conspiracy theorists start to believe the meta mega conspiracy theory that they're crafting, so they attend at their lives, uh, and it becomes a nightmare. So, Foucault's Pendulum is neither uh, mere conspiracy fiction, it's not Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, far from that. It's not even satirical conspiracy fiction like the Illuminati trilogy. It is a critique of both conspiracy fiction and satirical conspiracy fiction. Once you've read Foucault's Pendulum, 
you'll find all kinds of conspiracy fiction, even the satirical ones, utterly futile, okay? Uh, what's more, echo, echo is not a guastafeste. That's very important. Echo is not a killjoy. Echo is no boring balloon popper, okay? Because he managed to do this while conveying to the reader the same sense of wonder which is usually exploited by conspiracies because the book is marvelous. It's extremely seductive, okay? We have to take this into account. Um, in several countries, skeptic organization ask advice from important magicians, illusionists, like James Randi in North America or Silvan in Italy, this guy, in order to debunk uh, the tricks used by psychics and charlatans. This is Silvan showing the fixes by Filipino psychic surgeons, you know, those people who uh, pretend they're uh, performing surgery on you, for example, removing a cancer from your body while pretending to rip off parts of your body, you know, raw meat. Uh, but of course, they have chicken entrails hidden in the palm of their hands. And Silvan showed their tricks. Many people were fooled by Filipino psychic surgeons, also celebrities, Andy Kaufman, uh, Peter Sellers, okay, many of them. And it was uh, very fashionable during the 70s. That's why uh, skeptic organizations started to hire magicians in order to debunk that. Running out of time. See, si, see, si, running out of time, almost, almost over. Psychics are illusionists themselves. Uh, but they don't describe themselves as such. Of course, they, they make you believe that they have powers, you know. So, illusionists can uh, uh, spoil their tricks quite easily. It's a tradition that dates back to Houdini, because Houdini was the arch enemy of psychics, you know. So, what is incredible, what is incredible is that skeptic organization and professional debunkers learn so little from the magicians they've been working with for such a long time, because they used magicians only for destructive purposes, for unmasking charlatans. Instead, they should have asked them how to be constructive. How can we retain, while debunking, uh, for example, conspiracy theories, the same sense of wonder and difference that psychic and psychics and conspiracy theorists exploit every day? How can we pierce the balloon without popping it like a killjoy will do? We've been reflecting upon, upon this for years, we cooperate with Mariano Tomatis and other illusionists. We run many experiments with narratives. That's magic to the people is uh, Mariano's slogan, you know, with the clenched fist, with the magic wand. The way we intervened in the debate on QAnon was a consequence of that research, okay? These are headlines that were published in several uh, newspapers and websites uh, about our intervention because we started to see the doubt, uh, we jumped uh, in uh, the QAnon narrative, we uh, started tweeting about the case and gave interviews to several media outlets, we explained all the parallels between QAnon, our novel Q, and our 1990s activities as pranksters. We suggested that QAnon started as a prank and then went out of control. What we said is, if QAnon's originators really took inspiration from our novel and wanted to pull a prank on writers, then they Foucault pendulumed themselves. This was a way of at least partially um, deflating and weakening the whole narrative. In fact, we managed to spread some confusion in the alt-right, in the QAnon community. The frame slightly changed, the frame in which QAnon was discussed uh, after we clearly uttered the word the prank, something changed in the way um, QAnon was covered also by North American media and um, uh, several right-wing online forums started to disavow, to take their distance from QAnon saying it's making us look like a bunch of idiots. But we did all this by trying to retain the sense of wonder which conspiracy theorists exploit because we did it by constantly referring to the original spirit of our 1990s pranks, telling about our old pranks, you know, explaining the difference between those pranks and these conspiracy theories. So we did it in a, in a way that was fun, okay? That's the difference between 
trying to satirize or do uh, an uptight coverage of conspiracy theory. You have to use the wrong weapons in a completely different way. Okay, so last frame. Moral panic on satanic ritual abuse seem to fade out, but resurface years later in the guise of Pizzagate. Okay, which in turn seem to fade out, but resurface this time only months later in the guise of QAnon. Now QAnon itself seems to be fading out. Okay, use relevance also thanks to the deplatforming of its propagandists because Reddit banned uh, the subreddit on QAnon and stuff like that. Alex Jones was banned, uh, banned from Twitter two weeks ago. But the, its key elements will certainly resurface in a new combination. Next time, we suggest to deal with conspiracy in a different way, or the vicious circle will be endless, ever more quick, ever more dangerous. Thank you very much for your attention.